Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Conservation and asks, what are the conservation impacts of having oil exploration permits in marine mammal sanctuaries and an exploration licence to prospect for rock phosphate in a benthic protection area? The Honourable Tony uh, Mr. Ryle. Mr Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Conservation, I'm advised that the conservation impacts of any exploration in marine mammal sanctuaries would likely be, lo uh, would, would likely be localised and minimal due to the limited activities undertaken at this stage. Addressing the second part of the question, I'm advised that the conservation impacts of exploration licences to prospect for rock phosphate are also likely to be minimal as there is very limited disturbance to the seabed, apparently, where, while surveying and sampling due to the small number of samples taken. Mr. Mr. Hughes. To the Minister, isn't it true that trawling, set net fishing, seabed mining, oil and gas exploration and production activities are allowed to occur in parts of the West Coast North Island Marine Mammal Sanctuary? The Honourable Tony Ryan. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm sure that member is very informed on uh, uh, on behalf of the Minister, I'm sure that member is able to give quite a lot of detail on what is in that management plan because that management plan was agreed and put in place under the Labour Green Government in 2007. Oh. 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 Mr Speaker, it was, a clear, it was a clear, simple question. Isn't it true those activities and all the Minister referred to was uh, me and the Green Party? Well, order the, I think the, the Minister wasn't disagreeing. He was saying the pointing out the member is likely to be well aware of what was in it and he's probably right. Uh, I, I, don't think I, I don't think the House could object to that. Uh, Gareth Hughes. Thank you Mr Speaker. To the Minister, given that marine mammal sanctuaries are set up to protect our most endangered mammals, will the Minister recommend that our marine mammal sanctuaries be added to the Schedule 4 regime so they can't be mined? The Honourable Tony Ryan. Look, on behalf of the Minister, I know that this Minister of conservation has a very strong commitment to conservation in New Zealand. I think her record demonstrates that, but I'm certainly not aware that the Minister has considered uh, that inclusion of Section 4. I'm sure that it must have been considered in 2007 when Labour and the Greens put the marine mammal sanctuaries and their requirements in place. Gareth Hughes. Mr. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Given that benthic protection areas, which prohibit bottom trawling and dredging, were established for conservation purposes, will she advise the Energy Minister to decline mining permits to dredge for phosphate in these areas? The Honourable Tony Ryan. Uh, Mr Speaker, on behalf of the Minister, uh, while benthic protection areas come under the fisheries legislation and exploration and mining permits are uh, administered by the Economic Development Department under the Crown Minerals Act. That's a responsibility of the Minister for Energy and Resources, and I am sure that they both discuss various issues on a regular basis. I'm unaware. I'm unaware if her ministry has previously discussed that matter with the Ministry of Economic Development when Labour and the Greens put in place uh, the zones that currently applied in 2007. Okay. Of order. Sorry Point for of order, of order, sir, but. The, the Minister spoke about what might have happened in the past, spoke about the Green Party once again, but didn't answer the question, will she advise the Energy Minister to that fact? I'll hear the Honourable John Banks. Um, Mr Speaker, uh, some of us listen carefully to the questions and listen carefully to the answers, and I refer you to 383. 383 says that an answer that seeks to address the question must be given. An answer that seeks to address the question must be given. That answer given sought to answer the question. The point I want to make is, during this question time, we've had members standing up and asking, seeking really, to make ask the question again for seven occasions order, when we could have seven order, more questions order, and learn something in this House order, instead of turning... Order. Order. Now, I've heard from my good learned colleague, the House is, uh, the way that standing order has been interpreted has changed in recent times, while the member was not a member of the House. The, uh, the uh, way this Speaker interprets that standing order is that an answer must, to the, must be given to the question asked, if it can be given consistently with the public, in, consistently with the public interest. If ministers don't want to be held to account, the answer is very easy. Don't be a minister. Yeah, it's, uh, this question time is for the members of this House to hold the executive to account. 
Members have a right to ask questions. Where, where members lace their questions with comment or unnecessary, uh, unnecessary assertions, you've heard the Speaker uh, make it very clear to them. They cannot seek the Speaker's help if the Minister picks on those unnecessary bits of lacing that are added to the question and focus on those. But where a straight question is asked, in a, in a parliamentary democracy, the House deserves an answer, where, unless the Minister deems it not to be consistent with the public interest to give an answer. And that accountability of the Executive is a fundamental function of this House. Now, the question is about whether or not, on this occasion, the, the Minister did answer the question. And, uh, and uh, it, uh, I mean, members have to be a little bit reasonable with the kind of questions they're asking. They, you know, where, they, where members are asking you know, hypothetical questions, it's very difficult for ministers to give absolute answers. There's a tradition in the House where members ask, try to pe press ministers on yes-no answers, that there's a tradition that ministers are not always, expe always expected to answer those. And, but insofar as is possible, where members are seeking information, I'll try to make sure they, they get that information if it's reasonable to expect the ministers to have that information. Sometimes, given the primary question, it's not reasonable. Look, on this occasion, to avoid any confusion, I'll allow the member to repeat his question, but members need to think about their questions. And where, I mean, some questions are clearly simply highly political, and, and it has to be reasonable that ministers can give a political answer to them. And, uh, and this is a fine judgment, but on this occasion, I will allow the member to repeat his question. Get point of order, and I will, I'll hear the Honourable Peter Dunn. Speaker, first. speaking further to the point raised by my colleague to my left, I think the point that he was drawing attention to was not so much to challenge your judgment in terms of what constitutes an answer, but the fact that answers being given by ministers are constantly being challenged by other members who feel that they're not getting the adequacy of the answer that they think they're entitled to. The question then becomes, Mr Speaker, who challenges the minister in terms of the, the validity of the answer given? The questioner or you as the arbiter, as the speaker? Because I think there is a sense emerging that there's a constant challenging occurring of answers that people don't like. This is not to, to in any way move away from the point you've just made, but it does raise the question of whether the speaker is the arbiter or the House is the arbiter. Uh, oh, look, Order, I don't, I don't wish to take more time in the House on this matter. Uh, I, order, I draw to the members' attention the questions on today's order paper. If members look at the on some order paper, on some question sheets, we get a lot of questions, do members, ministers stand by their statements and all that sort of thing. There's not a lot of, char you know, the, the speaker cannot assist members when they seek opinions like that. The first two questions on today's order paper asked straight questions. When did he become aware of a decision? And the second one was, why is he conducting an aerial survey? And when ministers see questions like that, they should make sure they answer them. And, uh, and we got into some difficulty today because some, and, but supplementary questions based on clear primaries like that, um, and the supplementaries asked were clear supplementaries. And again, the remedy is in ministers' hands. We've seen many ministers answering questions very clearly, and it's been very helpful to the House. And uh, where, where questions like that crop up in the order paper, and those first two questions, I'm aware, caused some uh, points of order to be raised today, but they were straight, fair questions, and uh, and that's where you know the House deserves an answer. Now, on, that, on this, we've heard some questions being asked today, though, where I've sat questioners down because they laced their questions with with uh, superfluous uh, information instead of asking a straight question. But the you know this is where ministers are held to account, and it is important that the, that this House can do that. The public expects it, and uh, I, I try to make sure that, that uh, where a question is just a political statement, there's no use seeking the Speaker's assistance. I'm not going to rule out members who've asked questions' ability to raise a point of order and seek the Speaker's assistance because I think that puts just too much onus on the Speaker altogether. But I do ask members to be reasonable. Some members are, in my view, going over the top. And they need to think more about the question they're asking before they seek the Speaker's intervention. 
I thank members' contribution to this issue, but it is an important issue for the House. And, and I've got to say, I think ministers have been answering questions very well. I think question time has been going very well, and I don't want to see it in any way derailed. And that's why I ask all members to uh, treat it with the seriousness that, that question time deserves. But I'll allow Gareth Hughes to repeat his question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Given that benthic protection areas, which prohibit bottom trawling and dredging, were established for conservation purposes, will she advise the Energy Minister to decline mining permits to dredge for phosphate on the seabed? The Honourable Tony Wright. Uh, Mr Speaker, as Acting Minister, I'm not in a position to be able to answer that question. I do know that this Minister of Conservation works tirelessly in the interests of conservation in New Zealand. I thank the Minister very much. Gareth Entry. Hughes. What will she do to make sure New Zealand's marine mammal sanctuaries actually provide sanctuary and New Zealand's benthic protected areas actually provide protection from seabed mining, oil exploration and indiscriminate fishing? The Honourable Tony Ryle. Uh, well, as the member knows, the, on behalf of the Minister, as the member knows, uh, the Minister has been considering these issues. Uh, her motivation uh, is to make sure that uh, New Zealanders can, can have confidence, I'm sure, in the marine mammal sanctuaries that were put in place in 2007 uh, by the Labour Green Government. Question number 12, Mark Mitchell. Thank you.